I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Is there anybody in here this morning who's just grateful to be in the house of the Lord just one more time? If so, you ought to stand this morning, you ought to clap this morning, you ought to let God know how thankful you are for the breath he's given you, for the sun that you saw, for the life that you live. Truly, God is worthy of all our praise, all our honor, and the glory. Let us go into a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we first and foremost want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us and bringing us thus far along the way. God, it's preaching time. I have studied, but I need your strength. I have prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. Take me out that you will step in. I decrease that you will increase. So I'm physically standing before your children. Let them see, feel, and hear a word from the Holy Ghost. Lord, have your way in this place. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. First, give an honor to God for allowing me to stand before you this morning behind the sacred desk at the Alpha Street Baptist Church. If you can, won't you just help me bless God for the pastor of this house, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. In his absence, for I do not take this opportunity lightly. Uh, to the Reverend Dr. Judy Frenchers Williams, to the ministers, uh, the deacons, trustees, ushers, staff, and members of Alpha Street Baptist Church, I thank you for opening your doors to me this morning, for allowing me to be with you all just one more time. I bring you greetings from down the street at First AME Church of Alexandria, where my pastor is the Reverend Abraham Smith Jr., and he's here with me this morning. Thank God for you. Uh, to my fame family. We call them fame. So to my fame family, to all my friends, to everyone who's here present this morning, God bless you. There's a word from the Lord. I want to ask if you can go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at the 29th verse. It's our word of power, so we're going to get in and get out. Matthew chapter 14, verse 29. And it reads, come, he said. That's enough. Before you get seated, if you can look at your neighbor. If you can look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is with confidence, up for debate and discussion, as a 20-year-old when I stand before you and declare what I believe, and I believe that black television yesterday was a lot better than black television today. Now, some may disagree with me, and that's okay, but I stand firm on that belief that black television yesterday is a lot better than black television today. The difference between black TV today and yesterday is you are guaranteed to find a drama and scandal watching black television today. It doesn't negate that black television yesterday didn't have drama and scandal, but you were guaranteed to find a lot more comedy, a lot more humor, it was a lot more lighthearted. Today, no matter what show you watch, you can find drama and scandal in black television. You'll find a scandal watching Empire. You'll find a scandal watching Power. Amen. <laughs> You'll find a scandal watching Greenleaf, the haves and the have-nots, if loving you was wrong. Real Housewives of any city. <laughs> Love and Hip Hop. The Quad. And the list goes on and on. As 
a 20-year-old, I, I was born in the late 90s, and I had the chance to grow up in the 2000s. And I got the opportunity to watch shows such as Smart Guy, One on One, Half and Half, All of Us, Eve, Sister, Sister, That's So Raven, The Proud Family, and the list goes on and on. And then, then I got to meet reruns of the 90s. And I was introduced to characters such as Moesha, Fancy and Braxton in the Jamie Foxx show. <laughs> Sinclair and Maxine in Living Single. Jobless Tommy. <laughs> Bruh Man from the Fifth Flow. <laughs> Shanene Jenkins in a show called Martin. Sean and Marlon in the Wayne Brothers. Uncle Phil and Jeffrey in the Fresh Prince. The list goes on and on, but but y'all, my ultimate favorite took place on the campus of Hillman College. Sometimes in the pit, where you meet characters such as Mr. Gaines and Kimberly Reese, Freddie Brooks and Ron Johnson, and who can forget Dwayne Wayne and Whitley Gilbert in A Different World. Y'all, I love A Different World. My favorite episode of A Different World took place in the last episode of season five. It was the episode where Whitley was at the altar with Byron, getting ready to marry him. You know where this is going. <laughs> getting ready to marry Byron, but Whitley is nervous because she still has feelings for Dwayne. The minister asks, Whitley, do you take this man to be your husband? Whitley can't answer. Byron asks, Whitley, are you okay? Whitley can't answer. To make matters worse, Dwayne shows up to the wedding and the butterflies in her stomach begin to increase. So now Willie sees Dwayne and she all of a sudden still can't answer. So Dwayne helps her out and gets up in the middle of the wedding, walks down the aisle, begins to profess his love to Willie and says, Willie Gilbert, I love you. Will you take me, Dwayne, to be your lawfully wedded husband from this day forward to have and to hold for richer, for poorer? Baby, please, please. And Willie says, I do. And y'all, I, I love that, I love that episode. I love A Different World. And Dwayne taught me a valuable lesson that day, is that when it comes to something you love, yeah. when it comes to something you care about, when it comes to something you can't live without, when it comes to something that life is meaningless and empty without, you will do whatever it takes, no matter the risk, the circumstance, the sacrifice, you will do whatever it takes to have that thing in your life. That's what Peter realizes in Matthew chapter 14. Peter pulls a Dwayne to see Jesus. Peter sees that Christ is coming, and Peter realizes that he's not complete without Christ. On the surface, you see a man walking on water to God in the form of flesh, but there's a background you got to understand that led Peter into this power. Jesus and the disciples have just finished feeding the 5,000. And after feeding the 5,000, Jesus is tired. So he tells the disciples to get on the boat, go to the other side. Jesus then resorts to a mountaintop or a place where he can rest, recover for the next ministry and the next journey that they're going to go on. The disciples are on the boat, heading to the other side. When Jesus looks out at them, he sees the disciples are caught up in the storm. So Jesus leaves where he is and begins to walk on water to the disciples. The disciples who are afraid and already in terror, they see Jesus and become, and become more alert. So Jesus, seeing their fear, says to them, do not be afraid, it is I. Then bold Peter says to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And at the obedience of God's command and the request of Peter's faith, Peter begins walking on water to Christ. On the surface, he's walking. On paper, he's moving. On Facebook, he's popping. Twitter, he's thriving. Instagram, he's glowing. Snapchat, he's shining. But for everything that has a shine, there's some scuffs that lie beneath it. So although Peter is walking on water, there's some stuff God sees in Peter 
that enables him to make that kind of move. There are some indicators, some characteristics, some traits that Peter demonstrates God sees that allows God to let Peter walk to him on the water. Before you shift gears to accelerate, there are some keys necessary and needed in the ignition before you can get on the road and on the way. What does God look for before he lets us move into that power? What do the characteristics, the traits, and the signs have to be like for God to call us to move in that plan into his will, into his power, and his way? What do you have to do? What do you have to possess? What does it look like for you to put the keys in the ignition before you get on the road and on the way? Well, I'm not DJ Khaled, but since I got the keys this morning, can I just share them with you? (laughs) Number one, God will enable you when you omit yourself from ordinary. God will enable you when you omit yourself from ordinary. Peter's request is bold. No one has ever walked on water No one has ever made this kind of request. And mind you, Peter has been with Jesus through the whole nine. Now, in case you don't know what the whole nine means, it simply means he's been with Jesus for a long time. And after being with Jesus, through the blessings and the miracles and everything Jesus has done, the conclusion that Peter realizes is that this brother is not ordinary. Ordinary brothers don't make nets get so full of fish that the nets can no longer hold them. Ordinary brothers don't speak a word to the centurion's servant, and all of a sudden the servant is healed. Ordinary brothers don't tell lame folk to arise, and all of a sudden they start walking. Ordinary brothers don't tell Jairus' daughter to get up, and all of a sudden she starts living. Ordinary brothers don't wear wonder garments that if you touch by the hem, all of a sudden you are made well. No, this brother is an ordinary. So the conclusion then that Peter makes, and I press on you to make, is that if the God I serve is an ordinary, if the ways he makes is an ordinary, if the blessings he provides are ordinary, and if I made in his image, then surely everything and anything about who I am must be far from the presence of ordinary. Okay, it's 7.30, so you ain't catch it yet. Let me try it again. If the God I serve is an ordinary, if the ways he makes is an ordinary, if the blessings he provides is an ordinary, and if I was made in his image, then John Legend had it wrong because I am far from an ordinary person. Last time I checked, it wasn't ordinary how he woke me up this morning. Last time I checked, it wasn't ordinary how he started me on my way. Last time I checked, it wasn't ordinary how he kept me in my right mind. God is not ordinary. Okay, can I get personal? It wasn't ordinary how he kept Lights on past due dates. Provided shelter with more month than money. Block circumstances from consuming you. Made a successful individual out of a broken situation. Brought up out of down. Good out of ugly. Light out of darkness. Strength out of sickness. If God ain't ordinary, then I must not be myself. Is there anybody in here this morning who knows that the God I serve is not ordinary, so neither am I? That's, that's, that's a word for those of us who sell ourselves short. Those of us consumed by insecurity that we question and doubt our gifts, talents, and abilities, those of us trapped in the confinements of mediocrity, those of us who murder our dreams and slaughter our visions, it is a word that you give yourself, that you don't give yourself enough credit. It is, in fact, an eviction notice to every demonic door in your compound that has tried to rob everything God has given you. God will enable you when you omit yourself from ordinary. But number two, God will empower you as you advance amidst your adversity. God 
will empower you as you advance amidst your adversity. Peter is in the storm walking on water to get to Jesus. He's trying to get to Jesus, but there's a storm he has to go through. The end result is Jesus, but there's a storm he has to endure. Because, y'all, discipleship has a cross to carry. Discipleship has a burden to bear. Discipleship has a storm to go through. Dr. Judy, I can understand this if the conditions weren't stacked against him. Going to Christ would make a lot more sense if there wasn't a storm taking place. If the sun was out. If things were working in your favor. If things went how you wanted them to. If you had no opposition, I can understand coming to Christ then. So the question is, what is it about Jesus that entices Peter to come to him in the middle of a storm? Well, Remember, before they got on the boat to go to the other side, Jesus said to them, get on the boat and go to the other side. So the expectation from the disciples is not to see Jesus again until they get to the other side. But when Jesus sees them in a storm, then he shows up. You ain't catch it, you ain't catch it. Before they got on the boat to go to the other side, Jesus said, get on the boat, go to the other side. So the expectation from the disciples is not to see Jesus again until they get to the other side. But when Jesus sees them in the storm, then he shows up. We'll try one more time. Third time, third time. Jesus told the disciples, get on the boat, go to the other side. So the expectation then is not to see Jesus again until they get to the other side. But when Jesus sees them in the storm, then he shows up. So maybe Peter decides to go to Christ because when he realizes that God showed up to me when he didn't have to, that God came in the storm when I wasn't expecting him to, that God showed up when I didn't request him to, it's enough for me to stop where I am and stop what I'm doing and let God know how grateful and thankful I am for everything that he didn't have to do in my life. Okay. Um, that's a word. That's a word, because for some of us, it was in our storm that we saw Jesus. Some of us saw him while going through hell and high water. Some of us saw him while dealing with illness and injury. Some of us saw him while we were lost in a broken heart. Some of us saw him when we were depressed and contemplated suicide. Some of us saw him when we didn't have a dime left to our name. Some of us saw him when we were unemployed. Some of us saw him when we were locked up and behind bars. Some of us saw him when we didn't have nobody by our side. And now I understand what them older saints used to say if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. Because when I look back at every storm I've been through and every situation I faced, if nobody was there, God God still was. If nobody showed up, God was still with me. If nobody was present, God still had my back. That's why the songwriter said I could search for all eternity long and find that there is none like you. Can I go further? Um, he leaves the boat where it was safe and a relationship. The boat was security. The boat was comfort. And he leaves the boat to go to Christ. Because there comes a time where you have to prioritize the calling of Christ over the comfort of relationships. I'll say that again. There comes a time where you have to prioritize the calling of Christ over the comfort of relationships. But check this out. There's a difference between the boat and Jesus that entices Peter to go to him in the middle of a storm. Can I tell you what the difference between the boat and Jesus that entices Peter to go to him in the middle of a storm? Here it is. The difference between the boat and Jesus is the boat is moved by the water and Jesus is just walking on it. 
The boat is moved by the water, and Jesus is just walking on it. One more time, the boat is moved by the same water that Jesus is just walking on. What moves and shakes me, the power of God has control over. What moves and shakes me, God is just walking on the midst of. So watch this. Coming to Christ may not cease the storms, but it will give you some strength to withstand them. You missed your shout. Coming to Christ may not cease the storms, but it'll give you some strength to withstand them. That's why the Bible says, he'll make my feet like hinds feet, and he'll set me upon high places. He'll make me like a tree planted by the waters, whose roots spread down in the river. It does not fear when the heat comes, nor does it tremble in the drought. I wish I had a Bible reader. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. He shall set me upon a rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Mount up with wings like eagles and soar. Run and not get weary. Walk and not wait. That coming to Christ may not cease the storms, but it'll give me some strength to withstand them. Can, can, I, go, can I go further? The storm, the storm that God's in control of, where Jesus shows up to, Peter is now walking on water. Which could suggest then that if the storm never took place, there'd be no need for Jesus to show up. And if Jesus never showed up while the disciples were on the lake, if a storm never took place, there'd be no walking on water because there's no need to go see Jesus, because they don't want to go see if a storm never took place for Jesus to show up to. <laughs> Simplified version, the storm was necessary to get Peter out of where he was to the place where God called him to be. God has a way of using the storms that hurt us to help us get to the place where we need to be. Because God knows how comfortable we get in the sun. And every now and then, he'll change the forecast of our life to get us to move to the power, place, and position where God has ordained for us to be. If the storm never took place, you'd still be in that relationship. If the storm never took place, you'd still be with the wrong people. If the storm never took place, you'd still be in that situation, carrying that burden. But God loves us so much that even in our storms, he will use the storms to get us to where he wants us to be. God will enable you when you omit yourself from ordinary. God will empower you as you advance amidst your adversity. And watch this one. God will embrace you with grace your guilt wouldn't allow. God will embrace you with grace your guilt wouldn't allow. Dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is when the reader knows something that the character doesn't. The dramatic irony in this case is that Jesus and us know that some chapters later, Peter's going to fall short. Peter's walking on water to Christ. Matter of fact, Peter asks God to let me come to you on water. And you and I both know that Peter is going to fall short some chapters later. Y'all, Jesus is better than me because if it was me and I knew a backstabber, a betrayer, uh, wanted to come to me on water, um, I'd have the water over him, and he'd be six feet under. Um, I'd increase the storms uh, so that he wouldn't get close to me. But, but God is gracious that rather than chastising Peter, rather than calling Peter out, rather than reminding Peter of what he's subject to do, the Lord simply says, come. 
That's a word for us because Peter is you and I. God knows we're going to fall short. God knows we won't do what we're supposed to. And he's not asking you to be right. He's not asking you to have it together. He's not asking you to be perfect. All God wants you to do is come. And maybe that's a word that if God is gracious enough to us to let us come, then might it be a conviction for us to be the same with others? That when you come in here, you don't have to have it all together. Just come. The assignment that God gives Peter is that later Peter is going to be the church which God builds his church. His, Peter is going to be the rock that God builds the church altar. God just says to come. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I told you, our power, I'm finished. But before I leave, let me give it to you the way my mother taught me. Because my mother taught me what grace looks like. Um, there was a time when I was younger, and I did something that I wasn't supposed to do. I said the wrong thing. So my mom told me, my mom yelled at me in front of my friends. Yelled at me in front of my friends and my siblings. And so me, who's feeling embarrassed, who's feeling ashamed, who's feeling guilty, I go to my room, I close the door, and I lock it. Now, if you remember when I was here in December, I told y'all in my house, we don't close and lock doors. So I close and lock the door. My mom calls me, but because I'm upset, I'm guilty, I'm shamed, and I'm embarrassed, I hear her call me, and I didn't answer. Don't do that. Don't do that. She called me. I didn't answer. I'm in my room behind the door because I'm guilty, embarrassed, shamed, and I didn't answer when she called me. So she comes in the room, knocks on the door, and says, hey, didn't you hear me call you? And I said, yes. She said, well, why didn't you answer? I said, because I was ashamed, I was guilty, and I was embarrassed. So I didn't answer the call. And my mom told me this. She said, I don't care how embarrassed you feel, how ashamed you are, how guilty you are. Whenever I call you, you still show up. When I call you, you still come through. Because as long as you live in this house, and as long as you're my child, whenever I call you, you still better come through. In case you slow and you ain't catch it, I come by to let you know that no matter how guilty you feel, how embarrassed you may be, how ashamed you might feel, whenever God calls you, you still show up. Whenever God calls you, you still come through. Because as long as you're his child, and as long as you live in his house, you still have an assignment over your life. Yo, I've got to go. But I was young, and I was curious, so I asked her some questions. I said to my mom, you had other children you could have picked from. There's two other children in this house you could have called on but you called on me. Why did you call on me when you had other children from the bunch you could have picked from? And here's what my mom said to me. She said, because your assignment doesn't belong to anybody else. <laughs> Goodbye, Alpha Street. May the Lord bless you mighty good. But I stopped by to let you know that God said your assignment doesn't belong to anyone else. I know you messed up. I know you made mistakes, but he still has a plan for you. He still has a purpose for you. He still has an assignment for you that God still is there for you. I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. Won't you stand this morning? <laughs>